Our second speaker today is Director Joe Como of the Office of Ratepayer Advocates. Uh, Mr. Como, thanks for appearing today. The Office of Ratepayer Advocates represents the residential and small business ratepayers at the PUC. There's a long history on why the legislature created the Division of Ratepayer Advocates, now called the Office of Ratepayer Advocates. The DRA was established in response to a time when the PUC had been considered a captured regulator, uh, a regulatory agency created to act in the public interest, but which instead advances the commercial or special concerns of interest groups that dominate the industry or sector it's charged with regulating. Other states, such as New Jersey, have ratepayer advocates. Also, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has a, a similar entity, and New York is currently discussing creating one. We believe that the presence of an effective ratepayer advocate is a critical tool to protect the public interest. Mr. Cuomo, please proceed with your remarks. Thank you, Chair Rendon, and thank you, members. <clears throat> um, I could threaten to take you through the uh, annual presentation, but considering the late hour, and I want to be respectful of your time, I won't do that. We have appeared before the committee and talked about the accomplishments that we have had uh, over the past year, and they are outlined in that uh, attachment. But basically, I wanted to open it up to more of a, a discussion and, and tell you something a little bit about us at a more granular level. Uh, the Office of Repair Advocates, I'll, I'll follow Chair Rendon's explanation. We were, we were created to be a voice of the primarily the residential and small commercial customers. There are other entities that have a voice at the commission, and those entities uh, do a good job in, in um, speaking for themselves, primarily the utilities, other large customer groups, small customer groups, they they have a voice there, but the biggest group, the people that, that get up and go to work every day, um, don't really have a voice because they can't obviously negotiate the rules and requirements of the commission and understand these very complicated areas. I think it was said that the average person <coughs> thinks about their utility bill about seven minutes a year, and that's probably a, a, a lot less than we do. Hopefully it is. Anyways, we, we, we basically do a lot of the legwork that is necessary in order to go through these uh, very voluminous applications and programs and policies that the utilities present to the commission for consideration and rates. And the, 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 the basic uh, legislative mandate that you've given us to advocate for the lowest rates consistent reli with reliable and safe service levels is what we do every day. I want to take you through an example of that. And one that basically sort of summarizes the breadth of our of our work. Um, back in 2012, I think it was, 2010, uh, Semper Utilities, which is Southern California Gas and San Diego Gas and Electric, presented their application in their, their general rate case. These are the large cases where they present over a three-year period what their rates are, what their costs are going to be. And basically, what we call is we're setting the size of the pie, how much money they need to operate. And this includes everything, uh, except for maybe special requests that come in uh, between those three-year cycles. And then later on, we get involved in what's called the rate design, which is basically slicing up that pie and, and having you know, various customer groups pay for a portion of it. So when Sempra presented their general rate case back in 2010, we had seen that they were asking for about a half a billion dollar increase between the two utilities. So our people, we reviewed their entire application, and we're talking about, I think it was about 40 boxes of files, and that is just the hard copy. We also have computer programs and other spreadsheets that get uh, sent to the PUC. We challenged and questioned the utilities' justification for the needs. We conducted our own discovery. We, we performed our own analysis and made our own recommendations, we developed our own forecasts, and we produced extensive record uh, for the PUC to conduct its own uh, decision making. And that's basically a core function of what ORA does. And we do this in light of the, the, the legislature's direction and policy, the governor's direction and policy. And we try to come up with something that the, the residents, ratepayers, and the small commercial customers can live with. And this was done over approximately a 10-month period, uh, looking at literally thousands and thousands of individual proposals by the utility. And based on that, we looked at operations, capital investments, even long-term stock options to come up with our own 
um, analysis and our own um, uh, look at what the utilities need in order to operate. And what we ended up getting after that process was about a 50% cut in what the utility asked for in terms of a rate increase. And that, that summarizes basically a lion's share of what ORA does on a day-to-day -day basis. We get involved in a lot of uh, proceedings to, re to represent that, that piece of the pie. It's, but it's also important to understand that when we're representing sort of the size of the pie, we're actually representing all the customers because we get in there and we, 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 we cut the size of that pie as much as possible. So there are other groups that, that do show up, like TURN, very good organization, UCAN. Um, there are groups that represent the unions. There are groups that represent uh, disabled veterans. And they all have a voice at the table. And together, I think, you know, we try to do the best possible job for customers. But when it comes to residential, it comes to rate design, our statute mandates that we represent primarily the residential and small commercial customers. And so, um, you know, with that, I just wanted to uh, be respectful of your time and open it up to your questions about, you know, what it is we do or, or something about our, 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 our going forward issues. Thank you, Mr. Como. Any questions? Sure. Sure. Mr. Quirk. Uh, President Picker talked about infrastructure and how do we balance, and he said he talked with ORA and TURN about this, how do we balance the need for uh, keeping the infrastructure up to date, keeping things safe with keeping rates low? The issue, the way I understand, comes up is going for what happened in 2010 with San Bruno is that we understood that there were there were obviously lapses in 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 um, investment in infrastructure, and our process at the PUC and what ORA is involved in is a forward-looking process where the utilities have to actually justify what they what they what they need in terms of, in, in operations, and then we look at that. and I, I hate the word that we use; it's called disallowance. I think President Picker used it. It's it's a terrible word. Basically, it, common sense is is that we ask the utilities to justify what they need. As as representatives of the government, which we are, we ask the utilities and basically any ind industry out there to operate their, their operations in a safe manner. We're prescriptive that way. We want them to operate. We, we provide guidance through, through codes and standards. How they go about doing that is within their business decision, they, they, but they need to do it. And what, the, what we ask the utilities when they come before the commission is to justify to us why they need the money for what they need it for. And that is really a pretty low bar. So if they can justify they need the money, they, they get it. They're not disallowed that money. And it's important to understand sort of a difference here in that when a utility asks for money, you know, like say $100 million to do X in this rate cycle, they continue to get that money to the next rate cycle. If, in, in fact, they did not use the money for, that, for the purpose that they stated for, then they're, they're not allowed to get that money again because... Presumably, they already had the money built into their budget to do it in the first place. And that's where sort of the second half of this regulatory structure comes in. We look forward. The commission and its staff needs to essentially look backwards. It needs to do compliance audits. It needs to make sure the utilities are actually spending the money where they're, where they're supposed to. So it's auditing the books, doing the inspections, and doing the, the field work in order to sort of look at how the money they've already been allocated was spent. So I think that that is really the, the proper way to, to frame the, the conversation. Um, so a 50% disallowance hmm. uh, seems awfully high. How, what's going on here? Why aren't, why are the utilities coming up with what you feel are bloated uh, requests? Why, uh, you know, why isn't it closer? Yeah, I think I think you raise a really really good question, Mr. Quirk. Um, often, and it's not just separate; it's all the utilities tend to, and I my my view, ask for a lot more than they always need in order to sort of position themselves for a haircut. And I, and I think that's unfortunately the nature of 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 what's happening because they always get something of a haircut, and they're always able to operate their businesses. Therefore, after 
10 or 20 years, you've got to figure either they're not doing things very good or, or they've asked for too much in the first place. That sounds like a, a real possibility. Um, is there anything we can do in procedures that would help to get more accurate estimates to begin with? Well, yeah, I, I've often thought that it, it does seem kind of strange that the utilities would ask for so much. I think there should be somewhat of an accounting for why they would ask for so much and settle for so little, but it, it's very difficult to get at that kind of issue. All right. Thank you. Vice Chair Patterson. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, it, it may have something to do with the fact that over a long period of time we're conditioning the utilities to respond that way. Um, I get back to the, the whole case about modernizing uh, the analysis. Uh, data really has got to be trustworthy um, and trying to move away from uh, sort of a, uh, I wouldn't say politicized, but the temptation to have it a, a politicized process. So I'm going to ask about the, uh, uh, the DRA's 2011 uh, Green Rush report. Uh, that was uh, a, a report that basically said that uh, there was some question about uh, protecting ratepayers from uh, excessive renewable costs, the like. I think what's important to me is, uh, right now, do you intend to update the, uh, that report, particularly in light of the fact that we will be asked soon to make a policy decision regarding moving to a 50 percent renewable? I can tell you honestly, we hadn't thought about whether we we're going to update it. The, um, the issue with the Green Rush report was that the, when we had a 20% renewable target and we were early in on the RPS um, standard, there were off ramps in the legislation that the, that the legislature put in there so that the commission did not have to necessarily approve all the contracts in order to sort of fill that, that bucket of renewables. And that report was talking to that specific issue that the commission had had approved more renewables than was than they were legally obligated to approve. Um, and the only point to that report really was that we don't want to create a um, a seller's market for renewables, and that is the danger of approving just basically any contract that comes in the door. We thought at the time that that the commission was not being selective enough about contracts. I can tell you over time, though, we have seen the cost of renewables coming down. And I agree with President Picker that the, what we're seeing is very competitive in terms of renewable contracts. The, um, the contracts, um, in, in terms of the, the, the host of renewables that come, in, that come before us now, overall are very cost competitive. We think that going forward, we should look beyond just it being a particular renewable, whether wind or solar or what have you, but that we look at the characteristics of what we need, the location standards, uh, the avoided um, uh, greenhouse gas um, standard that uh, I think President Picker had mentioned, thinking more of, of what attributes of that renewable generation we need and then uh, using that to basically judge one renewable to another renewable as, as a, compared to, to uh, traditional uh, power plants. And, and I know that uh, you know, the, the, the contract information is, is confidential, but we do see that. And so I'm much more assured that, that what we're getting is a better bang for the buck now than we did when that report was written. Um, I appreciate that, but given the fact that we're going to be making some significant policy decisions, shouldn't we back that? presumption up with some data. I mean, I, 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 look, I have, I have the same kind of concern that I've raised earlier, which is with respect to what appears to be uh, uh, a renewable overproduction, that, that there, there, there is, and that, that I mean, I've, I've, unless the briefings I'm receiving from the ISO and others that are showing essentially this, this, this o overproduction, overprocurement spike, the question is, <laughs> I mean, what do, we, what do we do with that? That's why I asked the question earlier about, that's why I think the off-ramps are important, because the question has to be, what do we do then if we have impediments to utilizing the overproduction? Mm. Uh, because then I, that, I think those create some uncertainties that I, I, I don't think uh, we'd, we'd like to 
see grow. I actually agree with you entirely. I, I think that uh, the, the, the real challenge will be trying to figure out how we fit 50% renewables into the, the, the day, basically. You've identified, I, I've seen it myself at the ISO, that we have overproduction in some days right now, and we're, we're predicting that there will be more overproduction. To me, that makes the renew that, that generation resource worth less at a time when there's overproduction. Now, it may create opportunities. There might be um, grid integration opportunities or storage or something else. We have to think of it holistically in terms of how we're going to put together the grid, much more than we have in the past. Because I think you're right. I mean, we, we've got situations where if we're buying a renewable product in the middle of the afternoon where there's already overgeneration and we haven't figured out a place to store or do something with that power, and we have other resources that are shutting off in order to, to bring that into the grid, then we're not really making any headway. So I, I agree with what you're saying, and I think you're saying basically we, we do have to consider it in, in a holistic manner so that we, we're not over-procuring when we don't need it and we procure it at the right times. And I think that's something that, that we still have to get our heads around. I mean, we're, we're, we're just at the beginning yeah. of trying to analyze that ourselves. Thank you. Um, it's just an observation. Uh, I, it, I, it, I, I don't know how our governing uh, arrangements with respect to your, uh, your appointment and your, and your term and the like, but I would think that we need to be seeing that office holders such as you who have a significant responsibility to uh, others other than just the administration should have an appointive, uh, appointing authority that gives you a term rather than pull a plug. Um, I, I, I think we need uh, uh, to reconsider that, but uh, that's just an, an, an observation. Now, I, I think it would help to be a little more independent, I think, and a little more secure that you have a fixed period of time um, ra rather than a, um, uh, you know, um, being, being uh, at the governor's uh, uh, beck and call, essentially. So, appreciate the. Thank you, Vice Chair Patterson. Uh, <clears throat> Vice Chair Patterson talked about the RPS, which was uh, an important uh, important aspect of the governor's plans this year. But it's it's only a third. There's also the building efficiency and the transportation goals that he has. In total, it's estimated that it'll cost about twelve dollars per household to implement the governor's uh, plans. His goals for the year, his goals for this year, moving forward. What are what do you think are the best methods, particularly relating to low and moderate income uh, households, for addressing these uh, these costs? It is tough to to figure out you know, exactly how we're going to keep costs down, and that is always what we're trying to do. the The biggest area that we see that we really need to keep costs down, and, and something that we harp on is in areas where we we don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money you know we 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 have policies that are important to the state certainly greenhouse gas reduction is important it's not to say we have to spend a lot of money in those areas but basically we do have to spend money therefore there are other areas that maybe we can cut back on or not be so liberal with um, we spend a lot of like I said a lot of our time with the general rate cases they're not sexy at all they're they're, they're very data intensive uh, um, examinations we do. But when we see that, for instance, in the last general rate case for PG&E, the commission uh, increased the, the executive bonuses that ratepayers pay for from 50% to 90% of those bonuses, that's where we, we take exception because we think that there are, other, there are areas that, that we don't have to spend money. So, you know, leave room for areas where we do have to spend money. Um, I agree that you know, people in, pay, in California pay a lot for their utilities. Uh, fortunately, we, we live in this beautiful state, and for the you know people um, can take advantage of that that good weather. But if you're having to live in the Central Valley and, and air condition a, a building, it it's a lot of money. So you know we have to look for these areas. We're we're it's always a case where where um, you know the the pie has to be split up between a lot of entities and if one entity gets a break another entity has to pay more so we have to do our best to keep the pie small I mean that's 
really not a satisfying answer, I'm sure, but you know, it's, it's the best that we can do. Okay, thank you, Mr. Como. Are there any further questions for Mr. Como? Thank you. Thanks for your testimony today. I want to thank both Mr. Como and Mr. Picker for their testimony and the committee for their participation in today's hearing. Uh, this fulfills the statute, statutory requirements of uh, this committee to hold an annual hearing with the PUC and the Office of Ratepayer Advocates. However, uh, we do have the discretion to ask you back, uh, Mr. Como and Mr. Picker, to uh, explore transparency and accountability issues and also to answer some of the questions that uh, we didn't receive full answers to. So thank you. Uh, this concludes today's hearing. We stand adjourned.